I would like to invite uh, our first moderator and our first two speakers for the first panel that will focus on uh, digital artistic cross-border collaboration. And the moderator uh, is Chiara Argantini, and we will have two speakers, Petra Hanus and Alma Salem. Please welcome. Welcome everyone who is here in a physical and digital presence. My name is Piero Bentini. I'm a curator and cultural manager, developer. Um, uh, she, for those who, who, are, who have visually impaired, I'm a woman, uh, she, her. Uh, I'm a woman in her 40s, quite uh, petite, small, uh, long red hair, green eyes, wearing a black uh, jacket with some animal beauty and a silver skirt that uh, is behind a, a block that is just in front of me. Um, I'm uh, very honored, excited and delighted to be the first voice uh, today uh, during this long uh, marathon of thoughts that On The Move uh, cooked up for us for almost two years. And I'm very grateful for the invitation because um, we do have collaborated on several projects and the yearbook is one of the latest, as you heard. And every time for me, um, what On The Move is providing is really a space to reflect and just to stop from the doing of projects like Crisley and be able to see, to zoom out, to harvest the learning and name them. And I think that's such a vital part of our doing because then it's the only way we have to protect to advocate for what we do and really to name things. Um, plus, uh, they have the bold uh, kept, uh, idea of capturing flying things. And I think this digital mobility is one of those. And it's still uh, on the moving and it's still uh, in the air. So it's a precious opportunity to pin it down uh, also with the experience of two great uh, guest speakers that we have today. Uh, so I really thanks on the move also for the opportunity to connect me with these uh, great and powerful voices. Today in this first panel, we have with us Petra Hanus and Alma Salem. Uh, I will briefly introduce them, but then I will also leave the space for a much deeper investigation of what they have been doing. Petra is a cultural um, program coordinator at the Good Institute in Finland. She is active mainly in the performing arts field, so she's taking care of projects that deals with dance, music, but also interdisciplinary projects. Her mandate within the Gate Institute is to promote intercultural exchange. So the cross-border, cross-cultural collaboration stays in that area, but she has a very specific approach that I really value. In the way she fosters her mandate, she's always uh, uh, attentive to voice silence knowledge and to challenge the hegemonic narrative, which means she brings a perspective that is really careful about diversity, diversification. She's part of a platform called uh, High Hatred Now, uh, Stop High Hatred Now. And also she's been uh, doing a residency project called The Right to Be Called, which is um, a project around uh, indigenous rights and uh, environmental justice in the Arctic. Uh, she's also part of a group of uh, good institute uh, practitioner looking for a more sustainable uh, future for the institution. So these two um, axes like span through her experience and the stories she's going to tell. Uh, Alma Salem, she's a, a Syrian Canadian uh, independent curator and cultural advisor. Her story spans from different geographies from uh, Middle East, Europe, Americas, and she's also exploring how to connect these worlds and also how to investigate the many possibilities that the arts has uh, to really expand uh, how we can promote social change through the arts, how we can mix languages, 
uh, visual, performative, physical, digital, to really enhance cultural relationship, peace and, and, and arts in political uh, conflict zone. Also looking at feminist issues, which is one of the latest investigations she's doing. Um, Alma moved also quite racistly, geographically, but also in terms of profile. She has been uh, part of institution for more than 20 years with the um, French Institute of the Levant before, and then the British Council as program manager of the cultural program for the MENA region. And uh, then she started her own baby, her own project, which is the Alma Salem uh, Bureau for Curation and Independent Cultural Advisor, and the Syrian Six Space Contemporary Art uh, Touring uh, Curatorial Platform. And now she's currently executive director of a political movement for uh, Syrian women. Um, to briefly introduce what are we speaking about in this first panel, because I feel it's quite broad and intimidating, uh, the cross-border digital uh, collaboration. Um, I think we look at how the many modalities, ideas and formats that digital can provide for us to explore creative cooperative processes, also looking at uh, the consequences or the side effect on the system of production and circulation and tuning. And to give you a really uh, uh, thin line, I would like to stay with the last example. So what, what it means um, touring platform, a curatorial touring pl platform and not a platform for touring curatorial work. And I think this shift in the vocabulary, it's really a shift in the perspective uh, because it means that we, we moved from the idea of a platform that provides physical occasion for touring for productions that has uh, their own uh, concrete physical entity to a touring platform that is the work per se, that is a nomadic pop-up organism that has the possibility to make ideas that exist in the ephemeral landing and appear and materialize in spaces. Um, I think that's a very specific angle that I'd like to enter into with them. And it's about um, something that I also mentioned in the yearbook when I was asked to reflect on the digital mobility and what it means. And I think we can really uh, make it meaningful if we profit from the specific key feature that the digital has to offer that stays in this idea of strengthening an intimate and interactive uh, connection. Uh, so the interactiveness is part of the digital that we can bring in how we uh, co-create and collaborate uh, cross-border uh, digitally. This idea of border, because actually through the digital, we can rewrite the border, but the geography per se, because we live in a real uh, virtual, but not fake uh, parallel world that interfere with the world we are living in. So it is a way to challenge political geographies and border, and also to voice silence knowledge and, and, and make space for alternative narratives and scenarios. Um, and on that side, I think it's important also to enter in a mindset where it is not or, or, it is not physical or digital. So there is always a hybrid, a hybridity, a metaphysical and not metaverse space in which what we do in the digital has a sensual impact on our experience. And maybe that's relevant considering the performing arts field. So for me, when reflecting back, I thought of all the meaningful experiences I have been through online, and those who really stays with me mobilize somehow my emotion. So we're not a situation put online while born for the analogical uh, space. So we're not just surrogate, but really explore the potential and of the uh, digital environment to impact the format and how they were made. Having said that, I don't wanna take so much space and time from um, the reflection and the stories we're going to hear today. But to enter uh, and connecting this frame with their own story, I would like to start from the personal and start from the essence. So not necessarily in the digital feature, but to be able to move uh, a meaningful cross-border collaboration in the digital, I would like to hear from them, from their own story, uh, what makes uh, cross-border collaboration meaningful in the first place. 
to why and how this topic entered in their story uh, back since, even before the collapse. Because if we photograph that moment, maybe we can also see how this navigated in the, in the real world, in the, real, in the current world. Um, I might give the word to Petra and to ask you, why was it uh, in your story, this cross-border collaboration meaningful and appear in the first place? Thank you, Chiara, and thank you for the great introduction. Uh, yes, my name is Petra Hannus. I'm a blonde uh, uh, woman in my 40s. Uh, I, I'm wearing a pinkish, maybe that's the <laughs> color, long dress, uh, short sleeves, and um, <clears throat> I, I have glasses and uh, big uh, green earrings that are in the form of uh, leaves. <clears throat> yes, and I use the pronoun she and her. Yes, like uh, Chiara told, I'm, I'm working as a, uh, in the cultural department of Goethe Institute Finland. I'm in charge of the projects that deal with uh, dance, music, uh, theatre, and also some uh, uh, inter uh, interdisciplinary projects. Uh, maybe going back to like what what brings to me to why why are, why are cross border uh, collaboration so important? I think it was always clear to me that I will work somehow uh, in a more international uh, uh, field. Uh, maybe it has some some uh, something to do with my personal past. I was living in Africa and, and South America earlier, and and also in, in some place in Europe, and uh, it just. Uh, it just really feels uh, important to see people in other places feel, uh, see like uh, the other conditions people are living in. And I think it's crucial for us to be creative, to, to innovate, uh, to do uh, artistic projects, uh, to understand the world better if, if we just, you know, have more encounters. Yeah, I, I used to work for the city of Helsinki in, in Eastern Helsinki as a cultural uh, producer and uh, there it wasn't about cross-border uh, collaborations, but uh, there were a lot of encounters with internationality because uh, I was mainly working with, uh, with artists uh, with diverse backgrounds. Then uh, four years ago, I started working for, I, I found this uh, this uh, job in, in Goethe Institute Finland, where I thought, okay, yeah, that's uh, that there I could learn more about the international collaborations, uh, knowing that Goethe Institute is a really big network. Uh, there are almost 100 institutes in, in more than 150 countries. So uh, to get the scope of it, like it's really huge. <laughs> and uh, and um, I've been, uh, they're um, collaborating with, uh, working with uh, uh, residences. I'll talk maybe later more about the right to be cold that Kara already mentioned, and 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 uh, and some projects with um, that have to do with diversity. That's a, a, a big focus also in our our in the whole uh, Goethe uh, world. We have these uh, focus points, and, and you know, that's one one big uh, focus point, and. Um, and also in the past years, I've been in, in this uh, group that deals with uh, sustainability, uh, so uh, it's an internal, Goethe intern uh, network where we talk about new formats, uh, talk about sustainability, what, what we need to change in our, in our uh, practices. So um, um, I guess, is that enough? Mm -hmm. No, I would <laughs> uh, say it's a large yeah. scenario. Yeah, but, so, um, so just like, um, uh, even though I'm, I'm trying to uh, work and, and also in personal life, uh, think a lot about uh, ecological sustainability, but uh, I think it's, um, it's not taking away the part that cross-border collaborations are really, really important. And we just have to think of new formats, how mm -hmm. to do it uh, more sustained and more fair. To everyone. Yeah. Thank you a lot. I think what we hear, it is about this possibility to expand also the world we know through encountering one another. And I like that you said, we need to rethink the practices. So 
we as an institution, it's not just the artist needs to explore a way to survive. And I think that's pretty crucial. Um, Alma, you have a different story, I guess, and a different journey yes. that okay. brings other aspects beyond the expansion of encounters. Um, I give yes. you Thank you. So uh, my name is Alma Salem. I'm from Syria and I'm Canadian too. Um, I have Mediterranean features, so white skin, long, dark hair. Uh, I'm quite a big woman and I'm wearing all black and so happy to be here. <laughs> um, okay, so really where to start? It's, it's very difficult uh, to narrow down. Um, you know, a lot of um, a whole life, maybe. Uh, but I believe that, um, I mean, when I started, um, so, I mean, to speak about cross borders, I think that the meaning of my life uh, itself, since I was very little, I knew that I came to this life to see the world and then leave. So um, I think all starts from here, that I know exactly why am I here or what I want to, what I want to do before dying. And, um, and this is what I'm interested in. So since I was very young, I was uh, at university, I, uh, I organized the first, um, it was the first time Syria delegation went to the International Youth uh, Forum. It was 350,000 uh, uh, young people from all over the world who came to Paris. And it was the first time where Syria was present. So I wanted really to take Syria to the international place. And, you know, I come, Syria was very close, as you know. We all were trying to open it and uh, through through many mediums, one of them absolutely was cultural relations. Um, it's not an easy context because, you know, uh, sometimes these uh, relationships are, domina are dominated with, uh, you know, colonial, post-colonial powers, and sometimes uh, many try to break them and break structures, patriarchal structures of uh, hegemony. Uh, but uh, coming from a place uh, uh, where I was born under a dictatorship, um, at the same time, these cross-border collaborations appear to be oxygen, appear to be a must in that the sense that in order to break that intellectual siege, uh, uh, it was a medium for it. So always uh, cultural institutions, especially foreign ones in Syria, were the only path sometimes for us to, to even gather. You know, Syrians weren't allowed to gather and speak and, and create clubs. So uh, these spaces in itself became that uh, safe haven uh, or beside homes and beside small spaces here and there. Um, so for me, and, and um, the language itself was the first barrier uh, to cross, to be able to connect. So I taught myself languages very early, French and English, and of course I, I have the Arabic. So this also, uh, I think that the first place where you, to cross bar barrier is the language. So. Uh, yeah, and then at uh, IFPO, uh, talking about back to digital, the digital world, I, I believe that, I mean, I joined IFPO Institut Francais du proche in 1950, and at the time, the digital activity was all about documentation, I believe. Uh, uh, it, that was the key aim for it. It was a moment of uh, an opportunity to access, to give more access. So we digitized in order to open archives, in order to give access to people who can't uh, get into the physical uh, mediums uh, to, to touch them, to, um, to also rely on them academically and research and so on. So I archived 50,000 photos. Uh, from World War II and 7,000 map at the time. It was the, um, you know, the Force Française Libre du Levant um, photography aerial photos on uh, what you call daguerreotype. You know, maybe some of you would know. It's, uh, it's very interesting. So some of them I printed for the first time and then digitized them. So that collection is all online now. And it's not only aerial photos, but it's every single stone that was found in an archaeological mission in Syria. So, you know, when the war happened in Syria, I was so, <laughs> I was like, felt such a blessing for having done this over 11 years. That weren't easy. You know, me sitting in a basement at, uh, in Damascus working on this and at the basement also of the National Museum sometime. Yeah, and then the value just suddenly appeared of digitizing uh, that it's about, you know, conserving uh, heritage. And I believe that before we go to art, 
we, we, we should set the stone with heritage because heritage is the trace and being able to set the stone uh, uh, of, 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 of a trace and then you can move to futures and then you can widen the imagination. So these were my first uh, 10 years. And then the second decade uh, <laughs> started with the 2005, I, I was working with the British Council and this gave me a, an elan, uh, like a, a push for cultural relations. It was the trend at the time. This is the word we, the buzzword was cultural relations, intercultural dialogue, uh, cultural exchange. Maybe some of you in the room remember the 2000s, the millennium when we started. And the millennium was a, was a moment also uh, to bring people together because uh, it was like, you know, the Olympics in, in a kind, like everyone wanted to meet, everyone wanted to work. And I believe that at the time we were, we were more analog <laughs> than ever before. We were traveling and traveling and creating forums and, and cultural leadership gatherings. And it was the, the moment of mobility. And the convention, 2005 convention for cultural diversity also, pushed that into looking at the peripheric uh, cultural peripheric of Europe and cultural and the and the Mediterranean too and North Africa all that movement was happening there and uh, it was a, also a very exciting time where we uh, made uh, artistic friendships and I believe that this set uh, a good uh, uh, like I mean a good base also to be able to move into the digital era mm. with strong relationships so we know the people but that i think that this is something this is something we should never forget that those who managed to get together knew each other first uh, those who um, created the best digital experience are people who came in person together who trusted each other who had a a nice dinner together who had, as we say in Arabic, salt and bread, you know? Mm -hmm. So, mm -hmm. yeah, um, that's it. I mean, uh, I think that this is it. Maybe yeah. I will leave the third, uh, really the, the think, actual digital work yeah. to another. I think we already enter in that, in that sphere. The reason why I wanted to start so uh, far away, it's because exactly I was curious to listen to the essence of cross-border collaboration. So what it means and what it can do in order to move it in the digital sphere and I, I hear interesting topic here that goes from the possibility to challenge uh, space with you know expanded geography but also to challenge time because through conservation archiving of knowledge exactly there is the possibility to accompany something that is living in the past and in the future and i think that's an interesting also um, breathing space that we can explore plus this idea of having real connection real that can be physical because we have been meeting before but also real because the way we come together online has a specific capacity really to um, get us intimate one another so um, coming from this new huge topic i would like to explore um, also in a very honest way with you some examples or stories coming to the pandemic and what happened that function or not in your opinion so when was a project really meaningful what can be done online through the digital and what cannot be done honestly and this conversation uh, sparkled with petra because she was also very direct saying okay but not everything can be moved online so i'm curious to hear what can and what what cannot and also why what what's your opinion on that yeah <laughs> good question um <clears throat> uh i have to say that i'm i'm really <clears throat> um, um, glad and surprised how quickly goethe institute actually <clears throat> reacted uh, when uh, COVID started and, and all the lockdowns and, and this, uh, this, how to say, complete full stop. So uh, there were a lot of uh, <clears throat> digital uh, offers and, and, for example, <clears throat> there was from our music department from München, there was a digital uh, or virtual resident partner residence uh, fund created very quickly and it actually it was supposed to be only for the first year, but then it went further and uh, and there were a lot of uh, online uh, completely online projects uh, i i researched some uh, before this discussion and i and also i was last last week in in, in berlin in a in a festival about feminisms uh, 
uh, organized by Goethe Institute uh, Frequencies, it was called. So there I met some colleagues and heard uh, uh, from many very interesting uh, online, online uh, projects. Uh, for example, <clears throat> I heard about um, Procesos Creativos a Distancia, which was uh, which uh, they started in South America, where they had uh, where they had like uh, artistic collaborations. They really uh, they were I think they were put in pairs or they were groups, and they were they were really uh, creating something online. And um, for example, one uh, I remember watching one video where there there were um, uh, two uh, uh, artists who were who were sending material from their own uh, uh, places, and and then they hadn't met. They were really doing this. Uh, uh, intercambio, this exchange, and 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 they had met met each other, and then uh, at the end, where there was already something uh, created, then they met for the first time, at that also in online, and then there was like in, in Sudan, there were uh, really interesting, uh, completely digital, like they, there were a lot of digital re residences. Uh, Sudan moves, what that was that project called, uh, which also. Uh, you can find all these uh, online, uh, really interesting uh, backgrounds and, and podcasts. There were also uh, exhibition uh, created in that online, in those online residences. And uh, and uh, then I remember hearing uh, from one, one colleague from India uh, last week in Berlin from a virtual residency in, in, in Calcutta. So it was organized by Gertens of Calcutta. And it's usually it's a residency that is I don't know every year, and they they travel to Calcutta. And the, the city itself has a really big, great role in the whole whole uh, residency. So they created a, a online a virtual platform where they were actually really in Calcutta. And I don't know more about that project. So so I haven't been involved in that many. Uh, I haven't been actually involved in pure online projects at all uh, in this COVID. But we, uh, the the project I might uh, talk a bit about is the project Kiara already mentioned in the introduction, the right to be called, uh, which uh, ended up being hybrid. It was supposed to be really like almost only offline. So uh, it was about uh, uh, subjects uh, like climate justice, indigenous rights, uh, um, uh, climate change and um, and focusing on 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 indigenous perspectives so uh, the the idea was and it's an uh, like interdisciplinary uh, project in, in the Arctic and boreal region we were doing together with uh, Goethe institutes from Oslo here from Finland and then Novosibirsk and Montreal and uh, so of course uh, very cross-border very uh, transregional uh, project uh, but uh, the the idea was was having uh, to, um, indigenous artists uh, um, moving and actually there was going to be a residency relay where they would travel to two uh, various residences in these areas so Sakha uh, in Russia and and, and Sapmi and also Vasa here in, in Finland and then Norway and 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 Nunavik and then, of course, uh, it was already plan planned before COVID. So then, when uh, when COVID uh, quit all the or, or stopped all the traveling, then we of course had to think completely new uh, way of of the project. And we did have like uh, online gatherings in the beginning, where where uh, they were actually crucial for the beginning of the project, where we re because we really got to got to know the artists. They 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 were uh, explaining about their uh, practices and, and and works and showing also uh, pictures of, of, of the works and, and videos and and then the residency places they were presenting like they had like this virtual visits that we uh, they were giving us so um, it was a really important uh, the online part in the beginning but I have to say that we were so happy 20, 2021 uh, because we were all the time thinking okay do we have to make also the residencies completely digital but we were so happy that there came this gap where you could travel. We just had to organize everything really quickly. And there was canceling and reorganizing, like, I don't know how many times. And, and then there was all these um, practical issues, like uh, with uh, Sputnik uh, uh, influence, vaccination, uh, uh, you couldn't uh, travel to Norway at all. Also, actually, not to Finland, but uh, we, we got a special permit for our uh, artists from Saka. So we managed to do the project in a 
bit uh, like um, stripped away so that it, there weren't two residencies for each. Actually, for two people, there was only online residency, but for uh, only four people, or five, five people were really, yeah, five people were really uh, traveling uh, uh, to one residency. And, uh, and there we just saw when we, uh, when we had that, because we had the, uh, uh, the honor to have three of the artists here in Finland, uh, one going to Sapmi and two staying in Vasa and Malakpan, and, and we just saw how extremely important that uh, live encounter was for all of them. Uh, for example, our, <coughs> our uh, uh, artist from uh, Tatiana from Saka was was uh, telling me afterwards that she can't describe describe how important it was for her to have these discussions with a uh, Niap uh, artist from uh, Nunavik who was staying with her uh, like they had two times uh, two weeks uh, time where they were both staying in Malacca and then they had both uh, time apart and that and and it, it was so so crucial for her having these discussions and understanding that there's an, uh, a person from an indigenous nation from very far away who is dealing with the same kind of problems uh, uh, as as herself. So, uh, so for me, uh, it was a, it was hybrid hybrid. But for me, the most important part was the offline part. I have to say, but and and but it, it is possible to, for example, to build trust and 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 have the encounters uh, that we did uh, in in the beginning, but. But somehow it was it went to another level when we when we came offline, and and yeah, I mean thinking of like who can travel uh, for it's for us. Well, of course, think of the on the sustainable way that uh, like not letting people fly into Finland for one one performance or one one uh, presentation or so. So we try to really think of the sustainability issues, but we also think of like who is traveling. Yeah. I think that this um, project that's exactly uh, the right question to to ask. Um, I was very interested also in how the cross border, the digital cross border collaboration applies to institution. And I hear that before the pandemic, maybe most of them could not explore properly the resources that the digital offer also in terms of restructuring their own infrastructure globally. And I was struck by hearing that most of the places you mentioned are located in the global south. So how also the global north. global north, but also you mentioned other examples. Oh, yeah, the other before, ones I don't know. Uh, reaching yeah. out like mm -hmm. faraway branches. Mm -hmm. So again, we see the digital as a way to re-explore the geographical agenda also of an institution that can answer this question, who gets to travel mm -hmm. and why. So how this parallel geography is exactly a way to rewrite our power system and our world and to this topic, I think, Alma, you can open up a lot of perspective, exploring the digital as the real environment of a project that is born in that space for choices or not, but really exploring at the maximum uh, the potential yes. of yes. that dimension. <clears throat> Thank you, Chiara. Um, yeah, well, I mean, to continue the story, um, I mean, after this phase, 2011 came, okay? It was um, the Arab Spring moment in the region. At the time, I was leading on the US programs in the Middle East, North Africa. So this means 17 countries. So where really everything was happening. So I was in Tahrir Square. I was in Habib al I was in Erbil. I was, of course, in Damascus and Beirut. And, and, and I think that um, it's very important to remember um, because it's always considered that the Syria model as a, as a digital cross-border uh, model um, is an outstanding one, like how Syrians came virtually, maybe not digitally, but how they virtually came together and started creating. But we always need to remember that this need was created on the street. It was created with actual, you know, uh, blood and 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 the dancing and chanting and and uh, you know it it was created in the public public place and uh, then uh, suddenly with the absence of the public space and uh, the access to it where all the artists had to flee Syria because of persecution uh, and then not only artists because seven million people suddenly left Syria together and seven million were displaced internally so we're speaking about 14 million and uh, 
practically, in terms of geography, Syria disappeared for uh, as a as a common space as a common place so we uh, syrians turned from being in a place to a space i believe this is a moment of mm -hmm. a digital transform transformation so the digital world came to offer a space uh, to replace the place that became impossible um, and uh, i mean at that moment uh, we created projects uh, in uh, especially in the Levant, North Africa, and the Gulf, um, around 300 grand, and to capture the new voices and capture the vibes of the streets. And then, while we were creating these projects, they appeared to be happening online, mostly, because, um, because of many factors. So, the, the digital space responded to the fear factor. Okay, so it was, um, you can be pseudonym, on a, yeah. on, a, on a digital space, no one would know who you are. So it is. it gives kind of protection in the case of persecution. It created uh, as a space for um, uh, exploration, uh, research, uh, collaboration. So where people needed to meet. And I, I specify here mainly Facebook for Syrians because we spoke about the uh, Syria Facebook at the time that popped up online and even my mother and, and, and grandmothers and they were all suddenly on Facebook and it's still the most vibrant Facebook. Uh, and like now if I miss my mother and she's a painter so she's painting and she upload a, a, a photo of her painting. I know that today she was painting this. So it was also a daily need mm -hmm. to connect with people you miss, you people you lost in your daily life. So it's very human. It wasn't only a, you know, it wasn't, it doesn't only came as a collaborative space for creation, but also the community came together. It's where everyone is. So it became a country in itself. Um, and I think that this was a drastic model based uh, that was compulsory, like Maria said this morning, it was forced, it wasn't by choice. Uh, and I, I believe that, you know, we all know that uh, um, imagination comes as a solution. And uh, so the digital space gave that uh, possibility to reimagine um, the daily and shared life. And later on, it started developing. So uh, I hear, like, give example of what my colleagues uh, created, uh, a creative memory of Syria, so documentation, activists were, like, collecting. But then uh, spaces for meeting, we didn't have Zoom at the time, but it was mainly WhatsApp. Um, we, we, we needed Twitter for also lobbying, lobbying, campaigning. Those were needs at the time because we were trying to tell the truth and tell the story. So uh, also it, the only way to do it is to speak to the international community. So the digital space gave us access and gave us a place for voice. And at the same time, in terms of artistic collaboration at the time, um, I was trying to define this theoretically. So I found the third space theory of Fami Baba. Uh, Homi Baba is in the 60s, he imagined the virtual space as a space that is remote and physical at the same time and where um, people can come in all kinds of identities. So it, it broke the identity structure, the geographies, the historicality, mm -hmm. the uh, power, uh, power dynamics. And it was so inspiring for me. So I created uh, uh, the first exhibition I did when I became a curator. And why I became a curator? Because of the need um, to sof of sophistication. So conceptualization also uh, became a refuge for me to be able to bring together the physical space and the, and the digital space and also all types and all kinds of um, uh, people who needed to come together to, cre to, to, to create uh, a meaningful uh, product online. So um, I think that the digital space not only allows for artistic collaboration, so it's not only between artists, it's where, you know, politicians come, journalists come, activists come, uh, <laughs> audiences are there. So, yeah, we needed to bring all types of um, people together to, to, for that space be, to be meaningful. And this is where I created Syria Sixth Space later on. So Third Space was the first exhibition in London. It toured to Ireland and then to Brussels at the European Parliament. So it's kind of a complex uh, structure that brings the political need with the uh, digital tool. And the, at the same time, 
the possibility of an in-person meeting because many, many Syrians, they couldn't get access, they couldn't leave, they don't have visas, they can't travel, they don't have mobility. So the whole concept was where artists cannot be mobile, their art can. So it was a realization moment. So you could, um, I, think, I think every artwork, you know, starts with that magic element, surprise element. And I believe that this is what the digital space gave us. It gave us that the ability to, to constantly have a magical moment to realize what desperation and, you know, the, the, that uh, feeling of inability, mm -hmm. uh, getting stuck in a place where Putin is bombing Syria. You all know now what it means. <laughs> At the time, we were screaming and saying, and no one understood what it means. Like this, the, the, the chaotic, uh, meaningless uh, bombing that no one, no one can understand why. And it's the same today with Ukraine. So we were trying to, to find the meaning in that non-explainable non, uh, <laughs> uh, space. And I think that digital space gave us the not only the possibility to create, but also the possibility to have a meaning and to have hope. So I, I, uh, I give an example here of the siege, uh, hunger siege of Homs, uh, where, I mean, we could access the community there and turn their hopes and stories and photos and exhibit this in London. And uh, they, they didn't ask for money. They just, they were, uh, and, or in Hule or in other places. I, I worked with activists all over Syria who just sent me their photos to exhibit in that Syria Third Space exhibition, maybe around 20. And, and I, I put a focus on the um, citizen journalist at the same at that time. It, uh, it, they just wanted to tell the story. So we managed to collect, you know, from all over Syria photographies, put them on one wall, get the messaging, pull the narrative conceptually. So I think that um, it's not a simplified space. It's really, it has a potential uh, uh, to be, um, you know, um, a solution for so many impossibilities. Um, voila. And uh, then later on, I mean, um, well, I can continue that. <laughs> Yeah, I could speak for uh, three days about it. <laughs> so, <laughs> but uh, it's very difficult to know. <laughs> yeah, yeah, I know. And uh, maybe also in a few minutes, we, we will take some questions. So there is the space for explore even more. Okay. Um, for me, what, what I what I sense here, it's also a, a shift that you brought in, which is quite important from the notion of place to the notion of space. And I think this idea of the digital as a public space, as a new public space, it's relevant. Agora. Because yeah. actually, I was going to say that it is an agora where you can find confrontation, where you can find a melange of voices, but also you can offer anonymity uh, to people that could not speak out otherwise. Um, and I had similar experience uh, with other political situation, but that's really a value that tackled the topic of accessibility, because we are uh, often reminded that the media, the means, the technology of digital could not be accessible to every, everyone, but there is another side of that, which is actually the conversation that it enabled. And I do have also here another maybe question that goes to the... Um, um, melange and hybridity of the physical and the digital, um, especially from a personal, uh, professional perspective of someone who has often been active in site-specific projects. So my question back then was, how do we maintain this relationship? How do we make sure that what we do in situ and site-specifically, it is not narrowing down the possibility to speak internationally and forcing this national uh, narrative? So how do we keep it open? How do we make ideas circulating more than bodies eventually. Mm -hmm. And I remember we spoke about a couple of examples that also changes the way artists co-create work, like having idea flying to places without bodies, without touring. And I think that's maybe an in-between shift that tackles this idea of accessibility and sustainability with a specific model and practice. Um, so maybe if you want to just share a few words about this in-between hybrid and physical and why it was meaningful. Uh, it brings us to some final thoughts, but um, I don't know if you wanted to say more. Yeah. yeah. 
Maybe you start. I, you were starting. <laughs> what was the question again? The it's about hybridity. Yeah, Being the experience that were both physical and not uh, and, and digital at the same time, or virtual. And uh, you mentioned some example of the touring without going, for instance. So that kind of practices that can bring uh, things in between spaces. Mm. Um. Somehow now really stuck me like thoughts <laughs> <laughs> in the previous uh, discussion was so interesting everything you told Alma about about the different situations and, and the war situations and like really <clears throat> thinking of of, of uh, how important it is that we have the connection to also uh, these kind of places that are mm -hmm. either closed or like don't have don't have the possibility to 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 a physical mobility. Uh, but I think I have to think a bit. If I you can start, yeah, start, I can start. Uh, okay. Continue. So yeah, um, I'll give an example of a second uh, exhibition I curated. It's called Turab Earth. I spoke about it a bit late uh, yesterday. It was alongside the conference for the future of Syria that happens every year in Brussels, which is like for pledging for Syria. Theoretically, it is, it is like that. So I wanted, uh, actually, it was a collaboration with Goethe and the Cultural Diplomacy Platform. And so it's very important here to speak around, uh, about partnerships too. Because even when you create a digital uh, work and you want to bring that hybridity, you need partnerships. So it's always, we know that if we arrive to a place, uh, you need a local partner. Like here, for example, we are at the Nordic Point and on the move created that wonderful partnership and that made the space available for us. So we still needed to get into the old classic models of programming and designing and bringing, you know, uh, uh, the world together. Uh, and I think that um, uh, all the all the artwork was created online. So the collaboration happened between artists in gatherings on Skype, on Zoom, on, not, we didn't have Zoom, yeah. on Skype, on, on mainly Facebook, on Messenger, uh, and, and the, you know, the classic also communication uh, tools, which is about emails and so on. So we were crea creating together, but also what, what was very important is to be able to create artworks that are uploadable online. Mm. So, and and the, the key challenge is how to create an artwork that doesn't need the artist to be in the space. Uh, uh, and this in itself uh, it brought a, a different model of cur a cur curatorial practice um, because you needed to be like, my, my aim at the time is to be able to click one button and send the whole exhibition even for me not to be physically in the place. Mm. And um, that, that, that in itself is, a, is an artistic challenge, is an aesthetic challenge, is how to, it's a scenography challenge. Uh, and uh, so, yeah, I've been experimenting. All the time I've been experimenting. So when I did Turab, it gathered 70 artists, thinker, uh, you know, uh, researcher, and it was in Brussels. It was so interesting because when I created the gallery, that is a very, very small gallery stuffed with artwork, I wasn't happy because it's so different when you live in the place and you have, like, I don't know, two months to create a space or when you pop up. So the pop up brings you into a last minute thing where you not necessarily satisfy your uh, aesthetic standards uh, and you need to manage also with lack of resources. And, mm -hmm. and we need to know that always resources for students were very, very limited. Um, uh, all, all those challenges of, I, I sometimes um, put it together under the concept of lightness. I mean, we needed to be light in everything. A refugee need, needs to be light, can't carry a lot of, a, a lot of mm. uh, uh, even souvenirs and children toys. And, you know, and I remember what I left in Syria, for example, antiquities, uh, uh, carpets, <laughs> all this you, can't, you don't carry. And it was the same in the artistic model. The Syrian artists needed to be light in their creation for, in order for it to travel, in order for it to be disseminated. And they needed also to gain... Um, uh, to gain their bread from it, so ne it needed to sell. It's like uh, this multitude of challenges uh, that the digital space offered and at the same time limited. So when I, when I, I, I remember being in that gallery after displaying all the artworks, I got in and I felt a void, uh, a void and, and pain uh, of not having the audiences 
who should be seeing this. You know, it was it was us speaking to the audience. It was Syrians speaking to to audiences in, uh, to Bel to Belgian audience, which is okay. Maybe it doesn't mean to them. So it also popping up and being online, you never know who who comes uh, to, who comes to that place and are these people interested are you really engaging so there's a lot of questions about engagement and and i think always we all look for meaning for what we do and that's the big question so at that time when i count when i came to that space that was all uploadable to its creation so either photography documentary i did also at the time uh, augmented reality i explored virtual reality and i bought i remember from amazon the eight dollars uh, you know uh, <laughs> thing because mm -hmm. because i'm not in a space that's offering the right technology to be able to to create uh, uh, virtual reality but i so much wanted this it's, a, it's an, an artwork i created it's about it was about pigeon breeders and flying over syria and so on uh, i don't want to get you in that place but <laughs> anyway okay. and that void and then i started contacting art syrian artists in brussels to come and performing artists specifically to get the place live and mm -hmm. musicians and i felt that yeah in order to be hybrid uh, be uh, creating online but popping up uh, physically in person when you pop up physically you need to have a, a physical experience you need to have an in-person e experience so this is where musicians in the place are important this is where dancers are are you know they they turn that place live you can just juggle whatever you want with the uploadable artworks but when you when you meet when you gather when you convene this becomes a totally different dynamic mm -hmm. and therefore totally different artworks and yeah it's all that and, and i just want to finish by saying that now i'm launching my new exhibition it's called wave uh, in paris on the first of july if you are in paris please let me know I'm, i'll be happy to invite you and uh, well i do have time to speak about it for, mm -hmm. because i want to just mention one <laughs> yeah um, well, you know, this one is, is very special because it's post-COVID. Or you want to move into post-COVID? No, I think we can... Yeah, finish with this. Yeah, yeah. 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 because um, post-COVID is, is so important. Um, it's a different phase. You know, being in the post-COVID, in the, in the COVID situation for 10 years before COVID mm -hmm. <laughs> was so interesting <laughs> because we came to COVID and we just smiled, you know, it's like, okay, now where people started, what to do, we shift, we, uh, everything, so we've been like living like this for, uh, for, ten, for uh, nine years. So we just, at the time, I think what we benefited mostly as Syrians <laughs> from COVID is being able to get different people in the room virtually. Uh, I, I would give an example, especially from my work, my current work as executive director of the Syrian Women Political Movement. We managed to get Peterson in the room uh, for our General Assembly conference. We managed to get you know the special envo envoys for Syria, foreign affairs, everyone, the, all the decision makers. We couldn't reach in the uh, in-person place, the physical place, they were attending our conference. So mm -hmm. the, the, all the political aspect that we were looking for and coming to it from the artistic place to the political place, I think it suddenly changed. And I found myself like in that place, actually turning from being an activist to someone who's doing actual politics mm -hmm. at this, at the, you know, being with the, at the Security Council, working for a project at the Security Council, the Human Rights Council, and all those places that uh, COVID really uh, helped us uh, to to bring there, but also our networks and our work and our and the meaningful cause. So there's always it all goes down into the need at the end and into the cause. If we don't have um, a meaningful message, if we don't have a meaningful cause to put online, then it, no one people will just scroll down. Yeah. So I think we always need to come back to point one, point zero, which is about creating great art that mm -hmm. tells a great story. And uh, even a, a great story cannot be told with poor art. So it's always about having quality of great art and at the same time, um, at the same time, a meaningful story uh, for, for visitors. Mm -hmm. And also sharing, I think, is a big big word, like uh, having all these great uh, projects and, and, and concepts and, and formats uh, 
you mentioned, uh, didn't you, uh, showing without going. Mm -hmm. uh, I thought it was a fantastic uh, idea. A couple of artists just mm -hmm. collected so many, so many various examples of, of real, uh, real formats that can be touring mm -hmm. without uh, a person or at least without a group traveling and 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 also it also made me think that uh, website also made me think of of the importance of of our networks and uh, um, and collaboration also not only between artists but also between uh festival directors uh producers uh like we had um we were uh, together with Curtis at london we had a project or they initiated a project imagining futures where festival directors from all over the world were uh, discussing uh, the future uh, and the like, role of uh, civic society and the future of uh, art in future and theater theater in future and and uh, and I think that kind of uh, it wasn't a very big uh, group but but they were like from all over the uh, uh, the world so I think that kind of curatorial uh, meetings groups uh, teams are, uh, could be very important in order to. Uh, Travel less to 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 um, how to say it, spread information on on various uh, interesting concepts projects. Uh, someone tells in that group, "Hey, I've seen this amazing performance," and so like, like not everyone from that group, for example, need to travel. So I think we we really need to think of of the privilege, uh, like like who gets to travel mm -hmm. and and yeah. And to make it meaningful at the most. No, I think yeah. in different uh, dimension, but there is a common line that is bringing together people that could have not otherwise mm. through yeah. the digital. Yeah. Thinking about the circulation of knowledge might be an artistic, uh, you know, vessel of knowledge or a political uh, issue and situation, and also uh, yes, this idea of. Um, creating online for the physical or creating. Uh, physical experiences that use the digital. So it's different model yes. with the same, uh, let's say, final aim, which is to offer compelling experience that can twist a message. Otherwise, we're just using the digital for playful, entertaining way. Mm -hmm. And that's exactly far away from our purpose. Um, yeah. can, I, can I just add here that the experience is very important yeah. um, because what you create digitally, like as digital artworks to be uh, displayed and exhibited in the in the physical space might not necessarily be interesting when, when it's virtual. So when you create virtual, you need to create virtual. You need yeah. to create a virtual interactive experience and, and take into consideration that space in the totality. Mm -hmm. uh, uh, so yeah, just having materials or artworks that were created and just uploading is not is not really uh, curating digitally. And that's mm -hmm. a learning I, I, I've had because, you know, I've I've done twice, of the two, two of the exhibitions I curated uh, were online, one with a website, two mm -hmm. actually were cre created for it, a website still, I'm so not satisfied with those websites because they didn't even bring the concept. And, and uh, I'm, I was still looking, I'm still looking for, a, to create a, a digital experience that is, that will give similar, mm -hmm. uh, you know, um, uh, similar uh, experience for uh, the, with the with the with the physical space, and uh, that in itself is something that we need to develop, I believe, yeah. as tools. And here, I just want to say that I I founded a museum uh, called the Freedom Museum, registered in Montreal. I just closed, and my aim was like, you know, okay, I'm curating this exhibition. I wanted to. I I, I had a question about the continuity and the audience and the and the sustainability. So I and then I closed it because. I felt that uh, I felt that I mean during COVID, um, I, I I did like a small survey with with you know uh, users or, yeah. yeah with users with mainly art art professionals around me and I asked them did you visit a virtual museum and no one said yes and so I felt that okay I don't wanna I don't wanna go into that place I just wanna continue popping up and experimenting because I feel that it's a time for experimentation, just want to add by saying that by the end of COVID, two key changes in the digital world happened. One is the metaverse, and the second is NFTs. And um, 
when I when I founded the museum in 2017, this is what I was looking for. The like a metaverse. I wanted to uh, for the audiences to have an experience where they feel the space if they if they have their casts. And but I'm not Mark Zuckerberg. And uh, <laughs> and then so I just want to say that okay, but now this is for the future a great opportunity for us mm -hmm. to inhabit those new. Uh, uh, metas and you know those new new universes I would say and and bring our interesting content and develop mm -hmm. it and experiment so yeah I think that um, uh, creativity is endless with the with the new especially the NFT for for me because this is monetizing this is monetizing this is what we've always spoke about about entrepreneurship in the art this is exactly it yeah. mm -hmm. so NFTs killed the curator from day day one. So we panicked, and it's and and it it democratized the space for artists. So we really need to go there, and we 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 shouldn't be afraid, and we shouldn't be late. We shouldn't yeah, be late. Uh, we should be a giant and light. Yeah. But we also right. need tools. We need knowledge. Also, the artists. That's the us. point, yeah. and um, that's I think a good food for thought for the panel that's going to come next. That it's exactly about how do we rethink also our skills, our attitudes, yeah. the methods. So how do we curate context, audiences, but also how do we help yeah. artists or as an artist we rethink uh, the way we do things and and somehow the priority of that. Mm -hmm. um, Maybe we can have a few minutes for a couple of curiosity questions or doubts, reflection, feedback from you here in presence. And, and also, I don't know if from the streaming, we can also welcome some thoughts. You have maybe to tell your name. And I guess I'm, I'm the founder of uh, CFW. I'm also board member of uh, On The Move. And you look. Um, I'm and uh, another Mediterranean woman with uh, white skin, well, white, and black hair wearing uh, a red dress and a black jacket. Um, so I think uh, as much as the um, digital world offering such opportunities for experimenting, testing, money, and whatever, I think we also, uh, it will only go okay for everybody if parallel to that there is a deep reflection about the legal framework of it and taking into consideration the unequal access to technology because we will be just transfer i mean as much as it's an opportunity that is uh, balancing the power and opening opportunity if this issue of equal access to technology and knowledge and ownership uh, legal framework for intellectual property it's not equal we will be just transferring inequality in this new universe. So um, it's really important that we tackle both at the same time. Mm. Hi everyone, uh, Boyana Panovska, advisor for Dutch cultural trans artists from, uh, from Amsterdam. Um, I was listening to you talking and it's you had like great examples of how internet and how artists and how we all use the internet during the pandemics. Uh, what I see is we are still in the honeymoon stage of the of the usage of internet. It's like when internet started in the 90s and it was a free space for everyone, getting access to everyone, getting information to everyone. And then came, then things started to to clarify in a sense of marketing, then came Amazon, then came Google. So then came the giants, then came the monopoly over internet. And my question is, where do you see the future of digital mobility, having in mind that we are also very fragile in this situation? We still haven't been obviously abused in giving our living rooms, our bedrooms, giving complete access to our lives. And it gave us so many good things, but where do you see the future with knowing the, the fragility of it, also for security of so many artists and cultural professionals that are in precarious situations? That's a very large <laughs> one. Um, yeah, I can, start. Start. I can ask. Mm -hmm. you want to answer? Yeah, well, I think the simple answer is inevitable. It's inevitable. It's like, this is this is a place that we created as humans and it's, it became bigger and, than us um, I mean 10 years ago when everyone was speaking about globalization like 
people used to wow uh, cultures uh, identities where what will happen and then today we 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 know we i mean we managed us as a humans to overcome all those barriers and challenges but in any case i don't see that we have an option to stay outside i mean to 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 bring down the, the net um so i think that we need to have our you know democracy democracy is not something we establish and then we forget about the democracy we need to work for democracy freedoms and rights every single day because the minute you turn your uh, head it's gone so this is a daily job for us to ensure security to uh, digital security to ensure uh, justice fairness access i think that this is something that is absolutely similar to the physical world we live in uh, we have social responsibility there and we all need to be responsible when it comes to the net and if i may add i think and i also like to address big question looking at what could we do in order to avoid this uh, you know the rife that you're mentioning and uh, coming also from an organization and an institution i think that we can exactly provide a space where we kind of uh, moderate the counter side, the downsize, the economical uh, risks and the legal framework for the people we welcome in it. So maybe rather than renting the production of more and more durable things, we can engage uh, our funding in defining and protecting a legal frame or uh, spaces that can actually enable people to create properly, avoiding uh, this hijacking the, and, and jeopardizing the freedom of, of the message. But that's... Um, easy and, to tell yeah and really putting uh, putting much uh, uh effort or or what to say uh, pressure on 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 keeping making them even sp safer the spaces mm -hmm. and, and yeah. Yeah. Northern Dimension Partnership on Culture. Uh, I'd had a question about competences. Um, so the digital sphere is becoming very dominant uh, and a really relevant dimension of artistic and cultural practice. So how does this challenge the US curators and program manager managers? What kind of elements of competences and skills are now topical and essential to acknowledge? What kind of competences do we need? Yeah, uh, I, it's not the next uh, panel. <laughs> yeah, we might leave it to the next panel. Just to be fair <laughs> to our next speakers. But there uh, you go. I will leave it. Yeah. I think. Shall we wait, uh, Marie? What do you think? Um, or. We can answer quick. The list is long, so I think yeah. we are not, uh, you know. Uh, yeah, I think I think it's only fair for the next speakers to be given, and we can maybe contribute there. <laughs> Thank you. It's a great question, of course. Anyone else? Unless we have time, that we have to fail. <laughs> How are we on time? I think we have a few more minutes. Okay. But, um... I can tell I felt pretty much like a baby when we started doing things online because we had to technically equip ourselves, which is one level, but also there is an attitude which is different to the listening, the listening capacity also to this online uh, audience relationship. So that was also my thought and the capacity to tackle different layers also in terms of accessibility. Uh, for me, it was really like a baby step in the darkness because of the fastness of the reaction we were asked to, to take, uh, but kind to escape the risk of doing something, um, you know, in reaction. I wanted to do something in response, which is different. And so many different competencies. Technically, first, check, and you can do your uh, courses and get updated, but it's more mm -hmm. profound and it's linked to how do you listen, how do you prepare a setting, so it takes another consideration also of uh, value your time and to expand it more, to set it down, because otherwise you enter in this uh, wheel and in the quick show timing that make everything mm -hmm. kind of superficial and not impactful. So it is also about the narrative you give, how do you impact, how do you measure and how do you document and narrate. 
um, I think the next panel will be really in trouble to mm -hmm. just define, but uh, uh, hopefully really helpful, uh, not just to listen how we can solve mm -hmm. these things, but to listen we were not alone in the you know difficulty of the challenge. I completely agree with you, Chiara. I think I really think, and I also think as from like for, from funders' perspective, I think that's something where we where we need to concentrate that it needs more time. Like the artists also need uh, time in their projects to to research these uh, new tools and new new formats, and, and that's something that has to be thought through when when thinking of, of uh, financing projects. Yeah, I think that it's we need to treat the the, the space as a, just a parallel space. So we need all kinds of skills depending on, to, on what we want to do. For example, my my uncle who is a cancer uh, specialist in Damascus, he reads for his daughter who is uh, also you know she she has the same specialization in, in New York. He reads the what you call it autopsy autopsy yeah, bi uh, bi biopsy mm -hmm. uh, something. So he reads for it while in Damascus they open cameras and they read. So I think that when it comes to skills, there's that depending on what we're going to do online. And we, of course, we need then the basic skills to be able to access. But it all starts also with, I believe, great awareness. We need to be aware about our responsibility of being in that place because it is a public place. There are children and there there's a lot of abuse and there's I mean, a lot of really bad things. So I believe that it all starts with that uh, equipping ourselves with enough awareness on um, to be able to juggle the, 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 mm. the place without, um, without uh, you know, uh, either uh, um, uh, putting other people in danger or putting ourselves in danger. I think that's the first really basic layer. And then skills, it depends of, on what we want to do and how are we going to use it. Mm -hmm. Well, I think we, are, we have to wrap up finally this first uh, session and panel. I wanted really to thank you, Petra and Halma, for the deep stories and the reflection you share, and also the honesty, the honesty of saying with humbleness what we have to do, but also uh, the generosity of the reality of the example. And I really thank you for being with us physically and the, the digital, uh, yeah. the up presence in absence. And... Um, again to the on the move and thank you so much thank you thank so you. much <laughs>